Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm Carolyn Waters, the head librarian, and I want to welcome you to New York Society Library tonight. Um, before we start, please, um, I would just ask if you could just turn off any cell phones. Thank you. That was perfect timing. Um, uh, so, or anything that might disrupt the presentation. We're really pleased to have uh, Richard Brown and Paul Cohen here to talk about their latest book, Revolution Mapping the Road to Independence, 1755-1783. When warfare erupted between Britain and our colonists in 1775, maps provided graphic news about military matters. A number of the best examples are reproduced in the book, including some from the personal collections of the Duke of Northumberland, the Marquis de Lafayette, and King George III, who many of you may know actually signed the charter for the New York Society Library. A facsimile of that is um, just outside the, the third floor. Um, other maps from institutional and private collections are being published for the first time. And Rick Burns, uh, a name you probably know, yes, that Rick Burns, has said of the book, this glorious collection, ravishingly beautiful, exquisitely curated, brilliantly annotated, is one of the most graphic and illuminating treatments of the American Revolution ever brought to press. Pretty high praise. <laughs> <laughs> Richard H. Brown is a collector of maps and views of the French and Indian War and American Revolution. He is vice chairman of the Norman B. Leventhal Map Center at the Boston Public Library and serves as a counselor of the American Antiquarian Society. He is also a member of the Madison Council of the Library of Congress and the Library Committee of the New York Historical Society. Paul E. Cohen is the co-author of Manhattan and Maps, which actually won our New York City Book Awards in 1997. He's also the author of Mapping the West and co-editor of American Cities. He's a partner in Cohen and Tony Farrow, Dealers in Rare Books and Antique Maps. And Barnett Schechter, our moderator this evening, is an independent historian and the author of George Washington's America, a biography through his maps, The Devil's Own Work, The Civil War Draft Riots, and The Fight to Reconstruct America, and The Battle for New York, The City at the Heart of the American Revolution. He was a contributing editor of, of the three-volume Encyclopedia of the American Revolution and Landmarks of the American Revolution and a contributor to the Encyclopedia of New York, of New York City, I should say. His writing has appeared in the Times Literary Supplement, the New York Observer, the Village Voice, the Washington Post, among many others. Please welcome Richard Brown, Paul Cohen, and Barnett Schechter. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Carolyn, for the warm welcome. I'm honored and delighted, of course, to be back at the library. And I also wanted to begin just by congratulating Richard and Paul on this book. Uh, as many map experts have told them, uh, even after poring over maps for years and years, coming upon this book is a revelation. Uh, and that's because in the maps that they've included, they've gone to 22 different sources to find them. And many of these are not only rare, but unique manuscript maps, uh, many of them never published before. Uh, so maybe we could begin with Paul um, you, you and Richard have been working together for years, uh, building this collection. Could you tell us a little bit about how the idea for the book came about, and then maybe some of the adventures, we might say, that you had in, in collecting the material? Richard and I have known each other for 25 years. Uh, he came, uh, can, is this? No, no. Just get a little closer. He, he came to our shop in, in 20, exactly 25 years ago, and purchased a, a map. I uh, remember it well. It was a map of New England. And, um, and that began a very long uh, uh, collaboration and friendship that, has, uh, that, that ended up with this book. Uh, Richard collected very passionately and with, with a theme, a very clear theme of what he, what he wanted uh, to his collection to consist of. And uh, af after a while, when you build a collection and put unique materials together and, and it creates such an interesting theme, you want to share it with people. And so we, we talked about uh, what kind of a project might be best for sharing the, uh, the kind of the, the, actually the thrill of collecting that, that he had experienced. And um, we thought maybe we'd write an article, but we ended up writing this book. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, there was too much to put in an article, I guess. 
And so uh, that's really how this evolved. And uh, many of Richard's maps are in the book, but we didn't stick to just the things in his collection. We and Barnett the same. Uh, we went to 22 different sources. I didn't, hadn't counted myself, but. Maybe uh, I could mention, know. among other places, that you went to the castle uh, of one of the British generals who fought at Lexington and Concord. Yes, that is uh, Hugh Percy. And uh, he lived in this place called Annick Castle. It doesn't look like it's pronounced Annick Castle, but that's <coughs> the way we're told it's pronounced. <laughs> and when you, we say it up there, they recognized it. Uh, so Richard and I and Mary Jo, Richard's wife, uh, we got on an airplane and went up to uh, Northumberland uh, to visit this castle. Uh, we had heard about it. Uh, there, we knew that there were lots of great maps there because Hugh Percy was, was not only at Lexington and Concord, he was in New York, he was in Newport, he was in um, uh, you know, Massachusetts. He, he, went, he was in, in a lot of the early uh, battles of the revolution, and he loved maps. He employed map makers, very famous map makers, who actually after the war went back to his, his, his land and mapped his properties. Uh, so he loved maps, and he took back to Annick Castle souvenirs of his battles. And they are some of the best maps of the revolution there are. Manuscript maps done by famous map makers, beautiful, chronicling the battles that he participated in for largely. And very few people have seen them because they don't let them out uh, very often. They're, they sometimes show them at, uh, at the British Library a few years ago. They had an exhibition where a few were lent. Uh, there are a few of them that have appeared in black and white in some um, catalogs, but we actually went to some effort to get them to digitize their maps, and we have reproduced several of them in the book. Now, Annick Castle, this, is, this, this does not really look like Annick Castle, because <laughs> when we went there, you know, Annick Castle is in a very grim part of England. It's up north where the weather is very bad. Uh, they, 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 uh, they, this, it's so gloomy here that this is the place where they filmed the Harry Potter movies. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, and very few people visit the place. I mean, we signed in the, uh, the book, the, the record book, you know, uh, the, we were coming, and uh, I think that the last person who had been there was six months before. <laughs> so not too many people come to visit uh, this castle. But anyway, there's some, uh, whenever I see this picture of Annick Castle, I think to myself, what's wrong with this picture? And it, 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 it's a beautiful day. I think Canaletto <laughs> is used to painting Venetian skies. And he probably was kind of, I don't think that Annie Castle ever looked that good. <laughs> so anyway, that's. You said you, you went to a couple of other important collections. You were telling me that George III was quite a, a map lover. George, George III liked maps a lot. And he has a tremendous collection that is at the British Library. The, the librarian of the geography and map department said, Peter Barber, said that if the entire British library burned down and that all that was left were the thing, maps and books that George III gave them, it would still be a world-class <laughs> library. And, you know, he, lots of people have looked at George III's maps, but very few people have looked at them at them as carefully as Richard Brown and I did, because we went through and looked at every single one, <laughs> day after day, turning pages, until we selected the best ones for our book. And very few of the maps had been, um, very few of the maps had been reproduced. I mean, people use, you know, the scholars and people who write books, they seem to use the same things over and over again. You just find the same maps. I mean, what we did, we made an effort not to use those maps. We made an effort to find new things. And we, we found all sorts of marvelous things in that collection, and we put them in the book. And uh, so that, that was one collection, George III. We went in to the, the Clements Library at the University of Michigan, where, where Clinton's maps and papers are. We went to a lot of different places to find uh, maps. So, <laughs> so I mean, another thing that sets your book apart Richard, is that after all these travels and pouring over so many maps, you decided to structure the book not just around the revolution, but
but to start with the French and Indian War. Um, can you talk about why that less remembered war is so important and maybe give us a primer with some dates? <laughs> the dates I can do. Um, 1755 was the start of the French and Indian War, went to 1783, the end of the revolution. So that's the time frame that we cover in the book and it covers also a period that's very little talked about, the period between the two wars and the mapping that was done at that particular point in time. I think that one reason, I mean, that the French and Indian War is very important to include is it was the first time that um, British forces, regular British forces, were actually on American soil. And this is an important event because America and the colonies, with that as they were then, mainly relied on colonial militia to fight off um, bands of Canadians or Indians on the frontier, and that was there for the defense, and they also had their own taxation. So they were pretty much um, a happy group um, with remote um, um, governance from, from England. So it really was um, the presence, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, the presence of foreign um, um, soldiers from England for the first time on American soil that really started this entire um, path. The, the other piece that I think is important is that many of the same personages were in both wars, and George Washington was in the French and Indian War, he was in the Revolution, obviously. Um, but Thomas Gage, who was a commander at one point, um, um, William Howe, who was a commander at one point, John Montresor, who was the most famous of the map makers, uh, was there throughout. So there is a theme that we can work on to build um, from the French and Indian War into how we got into the Revolution, and maps are really a helpful um, way of doing it. Did you want to tell a little bit about this particular oh, yeah. map? It's a, it's um, a fascinating uh, kind of insight into the sort of the propaganda, we might say, after the war. Absolutely. So this map really is its the first map in the book, and it really sets the stage for the French and Indian War. And this is a new and accurate map of the English Empire in North America by a society of anti-Gallicans. Now, the anti-Gallicans were a group of English merchants and tradesmen um, of fairly high rank. And their sole purpose was originally to boycott French goods, you know, <laughs> lace, um, um, all kinds of manufacturers. But later they came to advocate martial force. And that's about the time they were coming to advocate martial force. They put together this map. And the Indians, in case you don't remember this piece, most people don't, were in New France. And New France was given on this map that tiny little milky white area up there. <laughs> and what this map does from a propaganda standpoint is it takes all of the colonies in these bold colors and runs the claims of the English all the way out, um, presumably to the Pacific. <laughs> and the French are only allotted a small part of Quebec and these little white spots, if you can see them along there, <laughs> along the rivers and the lake. And those are, as they say in the title, the unjust encroachments of the French. <laughs> and so those, those were the encroachments that um, um, we're on the colonial frontier. The, the map also is important in that lower right-hand segment. Um, this is a part of the map that emphasizes the trade between Europe and the um, um, colonies in North America. Very important to the Anagallicans. And then, just for good measure, they throw in these insets around the outside. And um, those insets are places which would become flashpoints for the um, French and Indian War, and they include Louisbourg and Quebec and Crown or Scalp Point um, uh, up on Lake Champlain. Um, but uh, none of those places did the English have any maps of because they were all part of New France. Um, and so um, they borrowed these from Jacques Nicolas Blanc, a French map maker. And people back then had no compunction about, about um, taking um, maps from other makers, even ones that are at war with. So uh, <laughs> that's the, um, the end of that. By the time this was done, there was actually already on the colonial frontier, war had effectively broken out. And this is a detail of the um, anti gallican map. And um, what happened in 1753, George Washington um, went to the um, a fork of the Ohio River at Fort Duquesne, which is modern day Pittsburgh, as you see up on the left. And he found the French had come down and they had set up a fort there named Fort Duquesne. And he went back in 1754, he's 21 years old at this time, uh, to 
drive the French out, and the French actually defeated him rather soundly at a fort aptly named Fort Necessity. And uh, half of his force was killed, and he was lucky to be paroled and to leave. Well, the colonial governor of Virginia who had sent him there um, <coughs> basically decided that they didn't have the forces to take on now the French and Indians. And this is the key point I think that we were making earlier, is the militias couldn't do it. So they petitioned George III to send somebody, and he sent Edward Braddock over. It took Braddock um, uh, three months to get over, landed at Norfolk, it took him another month to get up to Alexandria, Virginia. And at Alexandria, Virginia, he, um, he basically felt that he had, according to the planning rooms of London where they looked at the maps, 45 miles to go from Alexandria, Virginia to Fort Duquesne. <laughs> 30 miles to Fort Cumberland there, kind of in the middle, and then another 15 miles over the Alleghenies to Fort Duquesne. So Braddock writes, a little quote from him here. Along the way, he says, um, all the geographic information given me is utterly false. <laughs> Nothing can be worse than the road I have already traveled, 120 miles. <laughs> and I have 110 miles to march through an uninhabited wilderness over steep rocky mountains and almost impossible morasses. And so what was to be a 45 mile trip turned out to be a 230 mile trip over the most impossible of terrain and he's dragging 12 pound cannons. He's having wood cutters cut 12 foot wide roadways. And he marches all the way and finally gets within two miles of Fort Duquesne, a three month march. And he's ambushed by a much inferior band of Indians and, um, and French and he's routed. He's killed. Um, every senior officer on his staff is either killed or wounded. Um, George Washington has, who joined his staff because he knew the territory, had five bullet holes through his garments. And the entire army, you know, took off from there and was driven back um, um, for, towards um, uh, Philadelphia, where they finally uh, took a gasp of air. So one of the things, the first battle that we have in North America, what we see is that those formations, the discipline fighting in the plains of Europe didn't work here. And the topography didn't work. You, the topography was, was wrong as to its ruggedness. The distances were wrong um, and to their mileage. And so this is going to be a very, very different kind of environment than the wars in, um, in Europe. So I want to just interject here how appropriate this is that uh, the beginning of your story coincides with the founding of the New York Society Library in 1754. Um, the library was intended to foster culture and learning in an already prosperous commercial town, which would become even more prosperous uh, during the French and Indian War with shipbuilding and military supply contracts. Um, but as Richard, also as you show in the book, with British military headquarters in New York City and French in control of Canada, the Hudson River corridor connecting the city to Albany and Lake George and ultimately to the St. Lawrence River was considered a vital strategic artery, as it would be in the Revolution too. Um, so maybe this would be a good place also, Richard, if you could kind of explain for the non-expert what, what we define as a manuscript map and how it's different from a printed map. Sure, well this is a manuscript map, so manuscript maps were generally uh, drawn on the spot for the most part. There's only one, or if a copy was made, maybe two. Um, they're done in pen, ink, and watercolor. And they really give us the best depiction throughout this entire era of what it looked like back then and what it looked like to them. It, these military officers who did these maps were taught to draw exactly what they saw in nature, so they're not stylized, they're not idealized. And um, the best representations we have is what the person painted when he was there. Maps were put together and published in London from many different sources, but they were a, a, a consolidation of various different maps. These were the maps that were kind of the Instagrams of the day. And so this, this is a map by Thomas Sawyer, a, a British engineer. You can just tell from the, and just thinking about it as a manuscript, you can even see the brush strokes um, uh, on the painting that's, um, that's been done. And um, he's put some frills in here as an extra, but what it really conveys to me is the desolation of, um, of um, Albany and how, what a desolate outpost this was. And of course, not surprisingly, Braddock's forces, you know, retreated up to there after they went to Philadelphia. 
And so here are these guys who've been nine months in the worst possible conditions, are now going to spend the winter in tents in Albany. And um, it couldn't have been, um, it couldn't really be much worse. Um, one of the surgeons, for example, Thomas Williams, had said, um, a grievous sickness among the troops, we bury five or six a day, long encampments are the bane of men. And, and that would be the case throughout both the French and Indian War and the Revolution. Now just quickly, you know, the, the importance of Albany, the great importance of it was that it was on this interior waterway. So it, Henry Hudson had been stopped there looking for a Northwest Passage, but it was the deepest part of the colonial interior. And you could reach the Great Lakes, you could reach Canada, and you could reach New York from that spot. So it was the headquarters throughout the French and Indian War uh, for the British Army. So top of the right. interior. Now here's, um, here's another battle which is really important, again, with this theme of, um, of what got the colonists going so that it could be linked to the revolution going forward. This is a battle of Lake George. This is a very kind of unusual and important battle. Um, it's recorded here by an American map maker, Samuel Blodgett. And um, American map maker, was, map maker was there to do it because Americans or colonials then were essentially fighting this battle. When Braddock came to Alexandria, Virginia, he had a conference of colonial governors. He asked um, uh, Sir William Johnson to come. William Johnson came. He was a personage that um, was very wealthy, he lived amongst the Mohawk Indians. And he told um, Johnson to put together 5,000 men and to uh, attack uh, the Baron von Dieskau, Dieskau who had come over to um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, yeah, if you could, well, yeah, great, uh, Baron, Baron von Dieskau, um, and to um, attack him as he was coming south. Johnson got as far as Lake George, built the stockade that was there. Um, Dieskau made it down. He wanted to essentially stop Dieskau in an engagement in the morning, and so, um, why don't you move along on that one, Barnett? So this is a morning battle that occurred, and uh, Johnson sent out um, both King Hendrick, who's pictured there on the right, but is old, and so he's on, only on a horse there on the, on the left, and Ephraim Williams out to um, uh, try and uh, stop these cows. And it, this is um, a, kind of an important image, because um, shortly after that, um, Hendrick was killed, as was Ephraim Williams. And Ephraim Williams fortunately left a a will, and so that was used for the founding of Williams College. So his, his death went for, for a good purpose there. <laughs> Especially for Williams Grant. Is there a question? Yeah, the two maps back, the manuscript map done by an engineer, what would be the reason that he would write backwards, city of New York? If you look at the yeah, I think, he, I think that was just a, it's a, just a, a visual technique. It's a trunkoy ribbon that he did, and he just, you know, used that as a trick. Would it, would it also have something to do with th that when it's engraved, the image gets reversed? I don't think so. I don't think that map was ever engraved. Okay. I mean, it, it, or intended that way. Occasionally, manuscript maps were in engraved, but I don't think that one was intended for that. And it's not all of them done that way. It's just, no. you know, it's just the way it's folded in. It's just to give a... Yeah. Some water. So, um, the uh, forces um, under um, King Hendrick and, um, and um, Williams were soundly defeated here, and they took off running back towards the main fort. In fact, there were too few of them really to have been sent out, and they would have been overrun by the, uh, by the French general, but the Indians who were with the French general essentially balked at seeing the fort, which was a stockade. They didn't like to attack, attack any fortified building, and also it had cannons, and they really would much rather fight with weapons um, behind trees and uh, in the woods and, and that. So the Dieskau said, look, uh, same kind of idea as Braddock, I'm gonna take my French regiments here and I'm gonna march it up and we're gonna take the fort by ourselves. And so the next picture, what you see, is you see in blue, Dieskau marching his elite French regiments up to the fort. You see here the cannons of the fort and as one of the colonials said, uh, we cut lane streets and alleys for the French. And that they did. And um, all the, though the battle lasted for another seven or eight hours, the French general was captured um, and the French went back north. Important part of this battle, a really important part here, 
is that this was done by colonial soldiers, and while it wasn't exactly a victory, it did capture the French general, and it was so much better than what had happened to Braddock that the colonials themselves started to believe that um, they could really take on these trained French commanders or trained British commanders from Europe, and um, it gave them the spirit that allowed them to believe that they could bring on the, um, the, the rebellion that became the American Revolution. So this was kind of a crucial battle. If um, Braddock hadn't set it up with just uh, a colonial force, it may never have occurred. But interestingly, in setting it up that way, um, he really fostered this sense of, um, of uh, independence amongst the colonies. So Paul, when the French and Indian War ended in 1763, New York's wartime prosperity collapsed into economic depression, exacerbated by British attempts to crack down on American smuggling and impose new taxes aimed at reducing the enormous war debt. Britain also wanted her North American colonies to shoulder the burden of their own defense. Uh, do you want to talk a little, Paul, maybe you can talk a little bit about Gage and Montresor. And well, Thomas Gage was the commander in chief of the British forces in North America from about 17, 1763 on until 1775. And he's pictured here on the left. And John Montresor was a very important man. He, uh, that picture of him in the Detroit Museum uh, is uh, quite a famous one. And uh, John Montresor was in America probably longer than any other British soldier. I think there was one other soldier who was here as long as John Montresor. He came over with his father during Braddock's, uh, during Braddock's time and uh, uh, spent a lot of time here. He was a brilliant designer of maps, he was a brilliant designer of forts, and he was uh, a great military strategist. In fact, you know the, the historian Kenneth Roberts, he wrote, he had greater ability than any of the generals under whom he served. And if he had commanded British troops in America, the revolution would have ended in 1776. <laughs> um, so we, we, are going to, we are going to see a number of, of, of his maps, and he's going to recur. Now, here's a map that he did not make. This is a very interesting map that we, we when we were looking through the George III collection, we started seeing these curious maps <coughs> that show the, the cantonment of forces in North America. These are where the troops, you see, when the British finally gained full title to North America after the Brit French and Indian War, they had, they had full title all of a sudden. Uh, they had lost a lot of money and they were, you know, struggling financially, as uh, Barnett was saying, but uh, they sent their best map makers over to make maps of this, their, their land. And so we have a marvelous group of maps that come about, but we also have this, these maps that show the British had a lot of trouble controlling this great big land. So they would shift their forces all over the country to, uh, you know, and, and this map shows where uh, the forces were Gage was, there's a, book of, there's a book of Gage's letters, and he talks about all the time he's moving his forces down here. Now here's a map that has a theme. There's no Long Island there. <laughs> there's no Philadelphia. There's no Boston, because their troops weren't being moved into those places. They, you know, this is a map that has a theme. And if, 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 if it doesn't get into the theme, then it doesn't get into the map. So, uh, so we have this, you know, the forces, uh, you know, you can see where they're moving the forces around. And it's very interesting to read Gage's uh, letters back home, because he talks about, I mean, in fact, that's mostly what he writes about, where he's moving his forces around. So, um, and th this was made, this map, this Cantonian map, was made around the time of, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the 1760s and 60s, mid 1760s, and there were there was a whole series of them, and we're going to come back to that, where it shows the troop movements in different places. But this is a charming little vignette showing the 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 ships in the harbor waiting for trouble, because the Stamp Act crisis, the Cramp Act had just, just been announced and they, uh, and, and, and there was, you know, we think of Boston more in terms of the Stamp Act crisis, 
But New York had its troubles too, and uh, this is a, a, a little. Uh, uh, is this when they actually landed the stamps? And it's supposed to be the they were landed. They were yeah. held in the port one yeah. day yeah. Uh, they for a while. They physically brought these bales of paper that were going to be used for all the documents that would be, the tax would be stamped on. And they and they and they and they, and they rioted. They, and there were and there were only like a hundred uh, uh, soldiers to uh, to ward off these eight thousand rioters. So they were outnumbered by quite a lot. And so there was there was trouble uh, uh, when the Stamp Act price was the Stamp Act was announced. Do you want to talk about Montresor's? Uh, yes. Well, Gage. This is a this is a famous map of New York. John Montresor's. This is a printed map of New York. And Gage, when the troubles were brewing, he's asked John Montresor to bring him a map of New York so that they could find their way around the city. And he couldn't find one that was good enough. So, you know, you make one yourself if that's the case. So he, um, he, he had to go and sneak around to the city because there was all this trouble there. He couldn't just, you know, take his, uh, you know, uh, surveying apparatus out on the street and make a map. He had to go. And so this map really is not, it, it, it doesn't name the streets. It's, he's very interested in the topography. We've got Greenwich Village up here. It's in the road there. But this is really the first good map that was done of New York. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it, it's, um, it's fairly crude because of the conditions under which Montresor was working when he, when he made it. But it's, it's clear the British were seeing New York as a site of trouble and, and where they had to they, their they were. There, right? They were seeing that as trouble, and you can see this by the way they've been, they're moving their troops in. And they, now this is, you know, as I mentioned that there was a series of maps, and we found them at the British Library, we found them at the Library of Congress, and we found them at the Clements Library. <coughs> we found six of these, five, five, five of them, five of these maps that show the progress of the troop movements. And uh, I, we've isolated here. Uh, you know, you see New York, not much going on there, no Long Island uh, or anything. And then all of a sudden, you've got Long Island. <laughs> and you've got uh, a bunch of troops coming in here. And then you've got Philadelphia. And more troops moving in. So you can see that this is a, a buildup because trouble is brewing. So this is the ultimate source of the Steinberg view of the yes. city. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a selective map. That's right. It's New York, and then there's the rest <laughs> of the country there. So uh, that was good that the Stamp Act crisis created this uh, uh, situation. <laughs> so Richard, uh, by 1766, Parliament had repealed the Stamp Act because of all this protest. And a period of relative calm ensued. Um, maybe you could take us through that a little bit with the, the sequel to Montresor's map. Well, relative calm in New York. I mean, they, <laughs> um, they managed to settle things down a bit. And so Bernard Ratzer in uh, 1767, it was actually published in 1770, was able to um, uh, do a more detailed um, and um, uh, considerably finer map than Montresor was able to make under he operated. Um, this map um, is best known in an edition that was done in 1776, and it's right downstairs in the reference room, the copy here. It's still a very rare map in 1776, large and, um, and quite beautiful. But this is one of four or five known of the first edition. The first edition wasn't very popular. Um, and so this one was given to the king. It's the only one that's colored that way, and it's colored for a king. So this is George III's personal copy of um, of that map, but if you have a chance, check the reference room downstairs to see their copy, it's beautiful. And here are details. Um, Ratzer followed the tradition of the British um, uh, military artists by putting a vignette at the bottom. So he did the topography and the map at the top and a vignette at the bottom. Um, but as it turns out, the vignette he did at the bottom was once again pirated from another military officer. <laughs> and in this particular case, it was Thomas Davies and, and Paul originally had um, had found this um, painting in the private collection. And the painting at the bottom, you can see, has been modified only slightly um, in order to create that detail. Now, it's interesting as you look at these two, because you can see smoke coming up. And as the 1776, a more popular edition, was the only one known, 
Um, people thought that this was a great fire in New York, but when we blew up a detail of this, uh, what we found essentially was a overturned boat that was being, um, the tar was being boiled to uh, repair the hull. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a great thing of digital photography to be able to look into these things that you can't see with the naked eye. Now, 1768, yeah, let's look onto that. Right. Yeah, so of course, they repealed the Stamp Act, right? But at the same time, they had their declaratory act saying, don't get any ideas, we still have the right to tax the colonies, right? So by 1767, 68, we have the Townsend duties and more protest against taxation without representation. Uh, and Richard, as you, you show with this map, uh, the occupation of Boston. Right, and, and interestingly, there was no cantonment map for 1768. There was one in the summer of 1767. It would have shown Boston on the map with a lot of troops there. Um, we don't have that, but what we do have is um, essentially a, um, a piece here that was done by um, Paul Revere, and it shows the landing of the troops in, um, in Boston. And um, Revere, um, in a detail, this is in the cartouche, you can tell already that the things aren't going to turn out well. As you can see in the cartouche, Lady Liberty is there with her foot on top of a British soldier, apparently a dying British soldier. So there is nothing about this that um, isn't belligerent. And, uh, he talks about the insolence of the British parades, and he talks about, you know, this was done, you know, just for the, uh, for British pride and against the, uh, um, to chastise the, um, the Americans. So everything about this map um, is already a propaganda map, and sure enough, um, things don't end well in Boston um, as they did in New York. You have the uh, well-known Boston Massacre in here from the Library of Congress view, um, also done by Paul Revere. Um, not the way it happened, um, but the way Revere thought it was best to represent it. And it looks pretty gory with a guy on the ground there with a, plenty of blood coming out. And so this is his famous um, uh, depiction of the, um, of the Boston Massacre, and from there, you know, things went on. Yeah, so we can see there's this sort of ebb and flow of tax and protest and repeal. Um, the towns and duties are repealed, and of course the, the one tax they keep is on the tea, famously, and by 1773, um, we're, we're in the run-up to, to war two years later. Um, Paul, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, those, this is, those two years. This is, um, this is the first map of the revolution. And it's a manuscript. It's a, it's, it's, it's a map that we saw at Annick Castle. And uh, it's, you have to go all the way to Annick Castle to see the first map of the revolution. Uh, though there is a printed version that came out three months or so later uh, than this. And it shows the skirmishes uh, at Lexington and Concord. Lord Percy, uh, was involved here, and that's why he took this map. You see, he, uh, he was, that's why he took this map back with him because it was a souvenir of that uh, encounter that was so important. Um, the, uh, the I mean, the story of, 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 of you know, I, I think that that the Gage wrote a letter. Uh, he says, "I want to acquaint your lordship, having received intelligence of a large quantity of military stores being collected at Concord." And uh, he ordered the troops to destroy the said military stores. And so he dispatched uh, you know, uh, uh, groups of uh, soldiers out. They, they, they went to Lexington first, where they encountered the Minutemen. He went to uh, Concord, uh, where they, you know, it talks about where they, they attacked again. Uh, there were many people uh, killed during that uh, skirmish. Uh, there were 65 British soldiers killed, 49 Americans killed. Uh, they had a hard time getting back because they were, they were shooting from behind trees and so on uh, in a very unfair manner that they thought. Uh, and, uh, and then they talk about Lord Percy's return, uh, escorting <coughs> the troops back. Uh, there are the two cannons that are talked about in the notes <laughs> that he dragged with him uh, on this uh, expedition. So this is a very important map because it is map number one and we reproduce it I mean, it's been reproduced a little bit in black and white before, but we give it a nice full page uh, in color, and uh, that's one of the virtues of our book. <laughs> <laughs>
so they, uh, Percy saves the day, he rescues the column coming back, they get into Boston, and then they get bottled up in the city, right? Then we have another map. This is by John Montresor. You see it's signed John Montresor. And then underneath it is, uh, is uh, uh, Major General Hugh, uh, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that Earl? Is that Percy? That's Percy's name. Earl, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's Percy. So this belongs to, this is another map that we, I mean, we, we found that one of our best sources of maps in this book were the maps that the officers took back home with them and kept them as their personal property. Uh, we found that this was the best, uh, the, the best, the best things. Uh, we found wonderful maps that General Lafayette had taken back and uh, as souvenirs of his battles. He employed a map maker uh, to accompany him so that his battles were chronicled so well. The, this is another map uh, that's on the cover was a map that was done and taken back as, as, as a memento of the uh, battle that was uh, a general in, the, in, in New York. And this, again, is a map. Now, this is done by, uh, by Montresor. Now, Montresor could make a very good map of all the fortifications and all of the uh, area around Boston because he had designed most of those fortifications himself. <laughs> and so this is a very good, accurate map uh, you can see that Boston is just a little island off there, and uh, all of this is filled with this Lionsgill and, and, you know, um, Fenway Park and, <laughs> and uh, the airport. Uh, they're all in these places where there is uh, uh, water now, <laughs> this map. So, so, so for 11 months, the British are bottled up inside this, this tadpole of a peninsula, um, and then they retreat. Well, they do. They're bombing. Well, they're, of course, we, 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 we skimmed right over the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, <laughs> Did you want to talk about that? No, not especially. But <laughs> <laughs> it was a bloody mess, right? We skimmed it over a few well, battles well, well, to get you back to New York. Yeah, we get, yeah we, 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 Bunker Hill took place, and, and of course, that was a battle that uh, you know the British held their ground at, at Bunker Hill, but. Uh, as, as Clinton said, a few more such victories will surely put an end to the British dominion in America. <laughs> so they held their ground, but they lost their spirit. <laughs> and, uh, and, also, and then Washington uh, put, was able to put cannons on Dorchester uh, Hill, and so the, the, uh, the, the British decided to evacuate. They went on, uh, there's a day. Yeah, they're just, uh, south. Yeah. yeah. The, they're down, bearing down on the city, forcing the British out. Forcing the British out. And so they, and, and there's a day that they still celebrate. Isn't it the day they have the marathon? Evacuation day. Yeah. It's evacuation day. They celebrate it in Boston. And uh, it's. It coincides with St. Patrick's Day, isn't it? <laughs> so it's a double holiday. Yeah. I think they go for multiple holidays. Yeah. So it's evacuation day, and, and, and the, um, the British. Um, there's, we have this wonderful medal that's in the book that shows George Washington looking over uh, uh, at, the, at the British evacuating the city. And uh, they go, they think, George Washington and everybody thinks they're going to go to New York. That's an obvious place for them to go. I mean, that's uh, a, a big goal. But they fool them and go to Halifax. And they stay there for quite a while. They stay in Halifax. Uh, licking their wounds, getting reinforcements start coming in from various places around the world, and they prepare to make a big attack on New York. Which, um, but, but here they show them training, uh, you know, keeping fit for this uh, big surge that they were going to make on New York. So here we've got, we're back in New York. The, the, by June of 76, they landed a powerful expeditionary force in New York. Um, Paul, do you want to go through the, the Sophia and the Blast? This, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about this. This is a map that we found in Northumberland Castle, uh, in the Annick Castle. It's a beautiful map that uh, Lord Percy had taken back with him in his big chest of maps. Um, and it's very interesting because when the, when the, the after the British had taken over New York City, a great big fire uh, burned down much of the city. It was, I, I mean, there have been 
two great fires in New York uh, that just completely devastated the city. One was this one in, uh, uh, that is depicted on this uh, map, and the other is in, in 1835 when the city completely burned down. And so just the burned area, the swath all the way up the west side, yeah. and the, that white area. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, and a lot of the I mean, a lot of the, the colonial city was burned at that time, and the, 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 the few remaining Dutch houses were burned. So, so a lot there was a lot of loss. But the British, you know, were. I mean, George Washington was planning to burn down the city himself because he didn't want to have a safe haven for the British, and he wanted to destroy the city. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. But they did it, I mean, they were, they were this fire took care of that. He's partly. Or did he said uh, Providence or some yes. honest fellow has done more than we were disposed <laughs> to do for That's ourselves. Right. <laughs> and this is the, um, this is the, this is the map that's on, that we have a picture of over there. It's a map that's on the cover of our book. It is a map by, uh, Blaskowitz. And Blaskowitz was um, one of the great, great figures. And this map is probably the best map of New York City done of the war. There's another map that's, that was done a few years later called the headquarters map that was done you know, in, in, uh, a few years later, but which is, has the same kind of detail and topography. But this map was completely unknown until about five years ago, mm -hmm. did you say four or five years ago? Uh, it, it, it comes from a general in the war, William Erskine, who fought in various uh, parts of New York. He, he was in uh, up here in White Plains. So because this is a map, it's a personal map. It shows William <coughs> Erskine's role in the war. So because he was in White Plains, and, and it, it talks a little bit about uh, where he was there. And then he was in New Brunswick. And so, you know, that's why we've got a little vignette there of New Brunswick, because William Erskine was there. But uh, there's a tremendous amount of detail here. It shows, for example, uh, where the British landed. It shows <laughs> Wallabout Bay. Bay, where they had the hulks. And uh, the prison ships. The, the, the prison ships. The prison ships where thousands and thousands of people died uh, in those ships. It shows Coney Island <laughs> down here. It's sitting out there, you know. And what did I? I looked up Coney Island, and that is the Dutch word that means wild rabbits. Wild rabbits. That's what they what Coney Island is derived from. And so that's uh, that's out there. Uh, I don't know if it's really. Good. And then there's the Negro Fort, which is a place that we had we, we had heard about this place, but it is a the, the soldiers uh, British. The British had offered freedom to blacks yeah, to come to South the Carolina, King, right? for South Carolina, and and they they were able to establish themselves. And this is the only map we've ever seen that includes the Negro, or the location of the Negro Fort. Uh, so it's it's not not all, uh, Fort Heights. Heights. Fort Heights. It's in the Bronx. Yeah. In the Bronx. And then here we have Montresor's Island. And Montresor, you can see his name keeps cropping up. He, he fought this island at one time. And uh, uh, did he ever live there, actually? No, no, I don't very think so. No. But he, but he did have it for a while, and the, the, and the British had forces on this thing. And this was a very, very difficult uh, place where uh, to navigate. And uh, got no Randalls Island that had been combined. They've been combined. It was Randalls and Wards. They filled in between. Okay. So, um, it was. A, they had. A, uh, they did, it, and it, it, they lost a lot of ships there. And in fact, there's one ship that was coming that with a lot of money on it to pay the British soldiers. And it sank there, and I'm told, or I read somewhere, maybe in the encyclopedia of uh, New York City, City that you worked on, that they still go looking for money in that place. You heard that? I don't know if anybody finds it, but anyway, it was a very treacherous thing, and that's why I got that name. And so, so they decided to make it a little more 
a little more room uh, to uh, a little more room. And uh, where is uh, this? Is, this was an, they exploded. This was this the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers, and they. I have a quote, you know, because this was the biggest, the biggest explosion that had ever, with a muffled rumble from the depths of Hell Gate, more acres of river surface was lifted into the air, a tremendous mass of rock and foam, 150 feet high. A sickening jar was felt on land, and seconds later, waves lapped the shores. The greatest single explosion ever produced by man was over. And that's it. <laughs> It was to, it was to navigation. Make, navigation because the, the Hell's Gate and, and, and all the ships were, were, were you know. They're sucked in by the whirlpools and the rocks yeah. cleared out. So the British, as, as you showed, Paul, in the Blaskowitz map, the British landed in Brooklyn. They, they won the largest battle of the war in August of 76, the Battle of Brooklyn. Um, and then they drove the Americans out um, through Manhattan and up into Westchester and finally made them retreat across, uh, across New Jersey. And the British occupied New York City for the next seven years, uh, making it their principal base of operations in North America. Now their hope, as we were suggesting earlier, was that by controlling the length of the Hudson River and the, the whole corridor between New York City and Canada, they would cut off the lines of supply and communication between New England and the rest of the colonies and crush the rebellion. We see that plan unravel, Richard, as you'll show, in part because of Benedict Arnold's efforts in the summer and fall of 1776. Yeah, it's a, another place where you happen to be a hero. Um, and um, Arnold was already in um, uh, 1776 a, a well-known um, officer, a daring one. Uh, he had helped take Fort Ticonderoga. And he had convinced Washington in the uh, fall of 1775 to let him lead an expedition through the uninhabited part of Maine to Quebec to take Quebec. And uh, he was then going to meet up with another force under Richard Montgomery in Quebec. Um, it was pretty foolhardy, but daring for sure. He lost half his men on the way, he lost his cannon. Um, he arrived there and uh, belligerently, they tried to take it on December 31st, uh, 1775. Montgomery was killed, Arnold was seriously wounded, but he refused to leave. He stayed and waited you know, and put on the trappings of a siege until the British came in the next march uh, with supplies and reinforcement after the um, ice melted, and Arnold started taking off um, down out of Canada. Quebec was the 14th colony, and at this time, it had thought that this was one of the most important things that could be done was to join Quebec with the um, 13 colonies. So he is with his forces moving out, and he comes to this place, um, Lake Champlain. And he more or less declares himself the um, uh, general or the um, admiral in charge of the fleet. First admiral of the American Navy, and he sets uh, workers to um, uh, building a fleet on, um, uh, at Fort Ticonderoga. And he has a few ships that he's captured before, so for the moment the Americans actually control the, uh, the lake. The British are also building ships in Quebec, but they can't sail the big ships down the Richelieu River. They have to make, build them in parts and then ship them down. This goes on from July to well into October, so it's late by the time the forces get on the lake. Um, they cat and mouse for a while. Uh, Arnold finds that he's terribly outgunned, and so what he does is he comes down looking for a place of advantage, and he tucks behind this place on the left called Valcora Island. And we can show that in a detail here. Now, Valcora Island is a 150 feet high and it's all rock and the British didn't see him come behind there and he forms from the island to the shore and the British sail straight on by and Arnold by the way was a really was a seaman that's that was his profession um, and the British can't come back up against the wind they can only get their row galleys and one or two ships in and so there's a fierce fight and as always uh, Arnold is uh, amongst the most fierce um, as nightfall goes, there's no clear victor, but it's pretty clear the larger British fleet's gonna capture him by the next day. So he does, Arnold pulls off what became really a recurring theme in, in the revolution. He um, escapes overnight. The British were, were satisfied that they had him locked up. 
And so that line that you can see around the outside is essentially the line of uh, Benedict Arnold's escape. He put muffled um, um, rags, on the, uh, rags on the oars to muffle them. And then overnight, they just uh, escaped and uh, downriver. Uh, Carlton was furious the next morning, chased them down, did catch most of the ships. Uh, Arnold had to scuttle his, and he marched overland to um, uh, Fort Ticonderoga. The important <coughs> thing about this particular engagement is that without this, um, Britain would have easily been able to go on to Ticonderoga and Albany, but it had gone so late in the year, it was mid to late October, that nobody wanted to fight a battle, nobody wanted to be marching from Ticonderoga to Albany at that time. And also a number of militia had come to reinforce Ticonderoga, so the British um, leadership called it off, um, and um, uh, they didn't make it to Albany didn't split the colonies, and that would have been um, an entirely different war had they been able to do that. So you can thank ben, uh, Benedict Arnold for um, uh, slowing that down. And there's a, uh, a quote um, from A.T. Mahan, who's the uh, leading authority on um, American naval engagements, which um, kind of sums it up. And he says, uh, this little American Navy on Champlain was wiped out, but never had any force, big or small, lived a better purpose or died more gloriously for to save the lake for the year. And so for that, you know, Arnold really um, actually performed a great, um, a great service. So in that sense, he really sets the stage uh, for the British surrender at Saratoga a year later as, as uh, John Burgoyne tries to come down uh, with a land army. Um, and of course, that brings the French into the war, a uh, stalemate between the, the land armies in the north and the British expansion of the war into the south with the capture of Charleston, South Carolina in 1780, um, which of course leads to Cornwallis's campaign up through the Carolinas into Virginia uh, and leads to his defeat at Yorktown in 1781. Yeah, of course, would you want to comment on sure. that? Sure, I mean, you know, and Arnold, of course, had been a hero at Saratoga too um, the next year, so he had a lot of hero badges before he, he lost them. Um, <laughs> so this is interesting, I think. This is Yorktown and, and um, um, one of the themes that we're trying to, to emphasize here is that Washington was always looking at New York City. This is where the British Army was. This was the prize. This is a, where he had probably performed his worst as a general. And he was always looking there. And he was looking there at the time that um, uh, Yorktown came up. Uh, but he had now had Rochambeau and the French. And Rochambeau said, look, I think I can get the um, um, uh, grass up to um, uh, the Chesapeake because he had to sail up from the French possessions in the Caribbean. And the French possessions were far more important at that particular time than the North American continent to both England and to, um, um, to uh, France. And so rather than stop at New York for the prize, um, Washington a little bit grudgingly went on and um, they, um, they go to Yorktown. And the important thing about this map, um, we've used it for exhibition here on, on this, is that you can see the French blockade over the entrance to the Chesapeake. And the British did finally send reinforcements down, but they couldn't possibly get through this. And so this is one of those things that was just a coincidence of timing. The Americans had been so disappointed with the previous um, uh, Admiral de Stang at, at several major battles where they thought the war could have been won. But this particular time, all the timing worked. They blockaded it, and they were able to um, and Cornwallis in, and he, um, he had no choice but to surrender. So we, we tend to think of Yorktown as the end of the war, but in fact, it was, it was really just the, kind of the second great turning point after Saratoga. Um, if, we, if we look at the Glasswoods map again, it reminds us that Washington, immediately after his victory at Yorktown, headed back up here to the Hudson to re resume this vigil uh, that he had staked out over the past seven years outside New York City. Um, finally, marching triumphantly in as the, as the British peacefully relinquished the city in 1783, November 25th, our own evacuation day uh, here in New York. Um, but Paul, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, the treaty map. Um, well, I, I will talk about that in, in, in one second, but I wanted to make a comment on what you were just talking about, uh, George Washington's uh, 
relationship with New York City, and he was, you know, the, the, the fact that the British were here uh, during the whole period of the war was a real thorn in his side, and, and he was always trying to get rid of them. And uh, there were different, different efforts made to get rid of them. And one day, General Henry Lee approached General Washington with an ingenious plan for kidnapping General Henry Clinton, who was quartered in a house on Broadway in New York. Lee wanted to snatch Clinton in the, in the pavilion where he napped each afternoon. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton objected, telling Washington that if Clinton was taken prisoner, it would be our misfortune since the British government could not find another commander so incompetent to sit <laughs> in his place. <laughs> I just wanted to get Alexander Hamilton's name in here. He's a popular <laughs> So was anyway, this is the this is the Mitchell map. This is we're going to end here. We're running over time. And this is the Mitchell map. John Mitchell made this map in, in 1755. We were thinking of starting the book with this map because it shows the conflict of the French and the uh, I mean the, the French and the English uh, at the beginning of the, the war. And uh, this is George the Third's copy, a beautiful copy of the map, uh, where it's, it's called the Red Line map. I mean, this map, I mean, John Mitchell used every scrap of information that he could find. He worked for, he worked for years on it. The, the, there are these notes along the back you know, over here saying that the colonies extend from the ocean to ocean. So Virginia goes all the way to the, to the, the city, according to these early charters that are mentioned here. But anyway, these red lines show the division of, after the war, the, the division of the properties. Uh, you know, the, the spoils of war. So that's called the Red Line Map. And there's one that the Americans have. It's been New York Historical Society. John Jay uh, gave it to the Historical Society. And then this is George III. Fantastic. Well, Richard, this is certainly a vivid way to learn history. Maybe we could just wrap up with maybe an observation about the educational potential uh, of these wonderful maps, and particularly with young people today living in an intensely visual culture. Well, I mean, one of the things that you, many of you have, I'm sure, read a traditional book on, on history, uh, probably noticed that um, there's a lot of text and little tiny thumbnail map images, so the visuals are often almost impossible to read. So really, this we've done the reverse of this book. We've taken big, bold visuals that are strong um, to tell a story, and then we've supplemented that, um, we've let the visuals drive the narrative. In the text, so it's kind of a different way of looking at it, and a lot of um, a lot of kids today, we've gotten a lot of response, and, and from high school teachers and various others who who've used it to, to really teach. And I think you know Hamilton itself, as you mentioned, that's a visual thing that's led to a great deal of interest in the revolution. So we think this is a good way to kind of bring people into to history who might not otherwise be um, be interested in it. So we thank you.
Sure. Um, Thomas Jefferson um, thought it was actually crucial that Quebec become a part of the nation, and uh, so did Washington. And he wrote a big address in French, which he didn't speak, but he translated into French um, uh, to um, for Arnold to take up uh, to implore all of the uh, citizens of Quebec to um, um, join hands. And you know they saw that as a um, uh, as kindred spirits against the British. But the British were smart up there. They gave them a lot of liberties a lot of freedoms, and it just didn't quite work um, overall. It might have if they'd taken the fort, fortress of Quebec, but they couldn't take it. And then by then, um, uh, British reinforcements came, and that was the end of it. But it was considered to be you know, of utmost importance in early in the war. So is that the genesis of um, uh, when she went to school there in the uh, late 80s, 90s, and they're still fighting about the um, <laughs> Oh, the French and the English. Um, um, well, I mean, the French were the French were pretty pretty ensconced there, right? And they had a highly developed culture and civilization there. But the British let them go with that, with the religion as well. Um, continued on, and so that was really a, a, a decent British tactic up there was to to not rule with an iron fist. So there's still, you know, an English French bitterness. I mean, almost anywhere that's been. <laughs> country of both there is. <laughs> yes. Do you know if Montressa had any influence on the British um, determining to um, enter, take the troops into Manhattan? Because after they win the Battle of Brooklyn, there's, there's like a two week period. So they finally decide to attack it at Kipps Bay. And yet, had they gone up um, to the Hellgate area, uh, they might have cut off the colonial troops. It, it might have made a difference, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I don't know, you know, he, he probably wasn't their reconnaissance group. I mean, I'm sure they had reconnaissance officers. I mean, they, they um, I think they made a lot of mistakes. I mean, Washington made a number of mistakes there. So they had so soundly defeated the Americans, but they clearly, the big mistake they made was to let them get across um, at the Bro Brooklyn Ferry Point at night, you know, and it was another one of those those um, uh, great escapes. So it, it's, um, um, you know, I think that there's so many ways the war could have been lost at any one point in time. I think Henry, Henry Clinton was really the one who was advocating going up to Hellgate or up in Westchester. And they wouldn't, Howe wouldn't listen to Clinton. He <laughs> absolutely, you know, hated the guy. So, and he, he got Erskine, the map guy, to recommend the tactics at the um, Battle of New York uh, because um, Clinton knew that um, Howe wouldn't listen to him. Uh, Cole. So, um, as you gentlemen know well, the war with the revolution was fought not just in America and Canada, but also the West Indies, Central America, the British Isles, the Mediterranean, Africa, India, etc. So, did you ever consider, when framing this story, uh, taking maps from these other theaters or operations? Yes, we did consider it, and we rejected the idea. <laughs> 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 because that would have. Um, you know, we were trying to narrow, but we did. I know, I know there are books about this, uh, about this, about this, you know, because it was a world war. It was a world war. And uh, yes, I know, the, 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 what is it, the great pit of, of uh, the dark hole of India, isn't that part of that, the whole thing? Yes, we know about that, and we decided to ignore it. <laughs> so, Cole is a history professor who was coming out with a book. Um, um, very soon, and, and it covers a topic that we didn't cover much tonight, but is really interesting. When Paul talked about Walled Up Bay, it's where all the prison hulks were um, containing the American prisoners of war, and you know, probably 40% of the prisoners um, died, or, or far larger than that. Probably 40% of the entire deaths during the Revolution were in um, uh, Walled Up Bay. So it was. Um, is it like at the foot of the, at, at the, the park. Yeah. Yeah, and it's now the Navy Yard um, over there. Thank you so much, uh, sure. for the Thank you. Thank you.